So here, at the back of Santa Maria Maggiore, we see the woman seated before the temple, and this is the temple on the left, um, and she can see that she's spinning red yarn. Um, she's dressed as a queen, and for that reason, and you can see below, we have two women <laughs> on either side of the child Jesus, one dressed like the one spinning, and one dressed more like we would think of Mary. So there's a bit of an interesting controversy about who are these women, and is this one actually something like Mary, or something like Sarah, or what? Um, but in any case, we have the temple, like the, on the other side, you saw Joseph sleeping in front of it. And just a detail of that. But notice the consistency of the architecture. Um, I don't have a really great answer for that right now. I just know that that's exactly how they made it work. Here's Joseph in front of the temple as well. And then we see some of this Mary, and there's quite a few of these images of Mary. Um, here, let me just give you some details here a little better. Um, this, is, this, this is that piece you just saw broken in half and, and made a little larger. And on the left, we see the Annunciation to Mary, which is taking place in the spring, which is according to the Protean Galilean of James, not according to the Gospel of Luke. And then we have um, the Annunciation to Joseph, and then um, what is really probably the marriage of Mary and Joseph with the temple, and notice again now we have two towers on that, which makes it a little different than the one to the far right, where Mary and Joseph are arriving, being directed by an angel to do the waters test, the test of the bitter waters. But I do want you to notice that very interesting set of stairway, the set flight of steps, which will be the way that Christians will depict the temple usually, because partly of the story of Mary being set on the third step, where she dances for joy. As she, when she was three, when she was first brought there. Okay, that's sort of a big overview of, of images. I want to talk a little bit about the thinking. Um, beside the stories of Jesus in the temple, we have these um, ideas, that the temple will be destroyed and replaced. Um, it comes up in Matthew, something greater than the temple is here, Jesus says, about healing on the Sabbath. I will destroy this temple and in three days build another, not made with hands. This is the quote that Jesus speaks in John, is referred to in the other Gospels as something that gets Jesus into big trouble. Um, and of course they say he means his own body, his own resurrection, so he becomes the temple. I'm going to rebuild the temple in three days. You can kill it, and I'll build it again. But not, and he doesn't mean, of course, a physical building. Truly, I say to you, and this is the prediction of the destruction, there'll be not left here, there's our text, one stone upon another, that will, be, that will not be thrown down. And then we turn to Paul in two places, but this is the quote that's so famous. Do you not know that you are God's holy temple? And he says later, your body is God's temple, so don't defile it. So it becomes the Christian body. And then finally, not Paul, but some other writer, we think. Ephesians is sort of now a questionable text in terms of his calling or not. But in him, this is a very important text for Christian thinking, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, a dwelling place for God. So it becomes the church. The community becomes the temple. That's all fine. Remembering the temple's destroyed, it becomes either Jesus' body or the community's body, and there's no more temple. And of course, this is a kind of retrospective Christian thinking, perhaps. But then also, there's a Christian tradition of a heavenly temple, the heavenly prototype, which is really reading Exodus. It's really reading the Hebrew scripture texts. Um, that, and King Melchizedek comes in. He was the priest of the Most High God. And if you think about Genesis 14, Melchizedek meets Abraham and, and offers him bread and wine. He becomes a priest figure. And in the epistle to the Hebrews, this is a prototype of Christ. And, and the actions in the, in the temple that, the, that Christ goes through in the heavenly temple are a reenactment of what happens in the temple sacrifices. So it's a wonderful text 
for friends of mine who are Jewish liturgy experts to try to read and figure out how much does the author of Hebrews, of this epistle in the New Testament, really understand the sacrificial process that happened in the actual Jerusalem temple and how much is this all kind of conflated. But in any case, we have this heavenly temple, this prototype, this perfect temple that exists in heaven, and the one on earth was only the shadow or the, or the model, um, and this heavenly priest, which is Melchizedek, who then Christ becomes the ultimate high priest, offering himself to God rather than the lamb to God. So we have these texts in Hebrews which really lay out um, the story. Now we have such a high priest, the minister in the sanctuary, and the true tent. It also becomes the tabernacle. Not just the temple, but also the tabernacle. For um, what, what was but a sketch and a shadow of this heavenly temple, for Moses was warned and so forth. So I hope that's making sense. We can come back to that. We get a really different move because we have no longer an obliteration of the temple and replacement of the body. But we actually have the idea that there's a heavenly temple. So back to central Rio Manchuri, in the nave we have this beautiful image of Melchizedek, and Melchizedek becomes really popular with Christian artists. So here's Melchizedek offering bread and wine to Abraham, who's arriving with his soldiers, and notice Jesus appears in the imagery. He's overhead. So suddenly the Christians are reading that story in Genesis through their own lenses as all prophecy of Christ. And prophecy of sacrifice and prophecy of the Eucharist, right? The priest that offers bread and wine is no longer offering a lamb, he's offering the Eucharist, which is in some way, in fact, the lamb. And we could talk about the lamb of God quite a long time. Here in San Vitale is another beautiful image of Melchizedek making his offering, Abel making his offering at what is very clearly altar in the church. That is it's right above the altar in this church. Um, and we have this, probably what exactly the altar coverings would have looked like below. So we have a kind of heavenly prototype of the thing that's taking place in front of our eyes as the priest makes the Eucharistic prayer and offering and says, to God, please accept these offerings as you accepted the offerings of Abel and of Abraham and of Melchizedek. In fact, Abraham and Isaac are on the other side. They're right over the same area. And finally, even in the seventh century, you get Melchizedek residing here as a priest at the same kind of temple, I mean, an altar with the coverings, with Abel to the left and Abraham and Isaac on the right. So we have just conflated what's happening. The liturgical action has become heavenly temple. And finally, in Revelation, the book that ends the New Testament, we have the prophecy of what will come. And the seer, we think is John, perhaps, um, I was given a measuring rod and told, come and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court. Leave that out, for it's given over to the nations. And they will trample over the holy city for 22 months, or 42 months. And then, in the next, in, in, in chapter 15, I looked, and the temple of the, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm talking about here, but the, the temple of, was opened, and out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues, and we see the temple opening, and it was filled with smoke. This is the heavenly temple. From the glory of God and his power, and nobody could enter that temple until the seven plagues were ended. And then, in, in verse, uh, chapter 21, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. So the new Jerusalem, the earthly recreation of Jerusalem, will no longer have a temple. That temple will only be in heaven. So we get some iconography around this. So Christ, this is from, this is one of the oldest apps mosaics in existence. It's in Rome, in a church called Santa Venanziana. And Christ here is seated and enthroned in front of the heavenly Jerusalem, which will have no temple, with his disciples around him, um, gemmed cross overhead, and so forth. 
And then uh, many images of, of this sort, of the, of the image that the seer revelation saw, the lamb on his throne, um, with, there's the scroll with the seven seals at his, at, on the footstool, and so we have the, the lamb, sacrificial lamb of the temple is now Christ, who is the lamb on the throne of Revelation. Now, on the ground, <laughs> what begins to happen is that pilgrims start, Christian pilgrims start going to Jerusalem. They probably start this at the late third century and in the early fourth. Uh, we know that they were there by the early fourth century. And um, they begin to think about what happened in Jerusalem. And the Pilgrim of Bordeaux tells us a little bit about that place of destruction that Steve was talking about. Where the temple once stood, there is a marble in front of the altar in which is Zechariah's blood. This is, this is the story of, the, of Zechariah being murdered in the temple. Two statues of Hadrian stand there, and not far from them appears the stone which the Jews come and anoint every year. This is according to the Pilgrim of Bordeaux. They mourn and rend their garments, and then they depart. That pierced stone, um, I asked you about this yesterday, it could well be the place of sacrifice. It also could be what is now the Dome of the Rock, <laughs> the rock and the Dome of the Rock today, on the Temple Mount, the place where Muslims come. Cyril of Jerusalem, who was Bishop of Jerusalem, says this around 350. And because of these words of Jesus, there will not be one stone upon another. The temple of the Jews opposite us is fallen. Sorry. Not that the sentence was the cause of its ruin, but rather the sin of the transgressors. So he talks about the fact that there is an opposite space where the temple has fallen. And it's fallen because of the sin of the transgressors. This is a great Christian trope. trope. The temple was destroyed because of the sins of the Jews. And it was God's punishment 